Hi guys, welcome to another video of Learn Political Science. This week we're going to look at Mary Wollstonecraft, particularly her book, A Vindication of the Rights of Women. But know that it's almost impossible to try and condense an entire analysis here and that this video aims to give only a brief idea of the themes. Let's begin. Mary Wollstonecraft's book, A Vindication of the Rights of Women, was published in 1792. It first received fairly respectful reviews as a piece on female education, but later was increasingly read against the backdrop of its broader progressive agenda, liberty. Mary Wollstonecraft was seen as a staunch advocate for the rights of women in Britain during her time. Her book has proved to be a classic text for feminism, making her one of the earliest liberal feminists in early modern times. Wollstonecraft had a very unconventional lifestyle that often sh overshadowed her intellectual legacy until the 19th century when she became an important icon for women's rights. The Vindication published in the aftermath of the heated French Revolution where concepts such as democracy and freedom based on the notion of natural rights of the individual became quite popular. Over here, Wollstonecraft's groundbreaking text pointed out that the various treatises written by men respecting the liberal rights of men actually apply only to the male sex. She insisted that it is entirely inconsistent for men to fight against aristocratic privilege amongst themselves while maintaining similar distinctions with respect to their wives and daughters. She suggests the task is to eliminate the hypocrisy which denies women are fully human rational beings and to raise men and women at a level at which they are able to relate to each other as equals. Mary applied the same basic arguments of the Enlightenment to the family, women and private sphere. She boldly appeals for women's inclusion in public life overwhelmingly dominated by men. In her analysis of patriarchal power, she sought to describe how women as a whole have alienated their liberty and in doing so have removed all morality from their acts. She recognized the inconsistency of the terms masculine and feminine as they were used in her time. Masculine generally referred to such virtues as intelligence, independence and strength all those traits that an 18th century woman would be reproached for demonstrating. Whereas feminine virtue was equated with such traits as delicacy, sensitivity and obedience, terms Wollstonecraft recognized as barely polite euphemisms for weakness, ignorance and slavery. She argued that part of the damage patriarchy did to women was to make them weak in mind and body than they ought to be that bearing and nursing children is one of the grand ends of women's existence. She urges women to give up the unearned privileges that come from their frivolous accomplishments and instead undertake to improve themselves in the same way as middle-class men. She believed that virtue should be founded on reason and reason alone. Her conviction that rationality is equally present in men and women is argued in part on theological grounds when she says, The nature of reason must be the same in all, if it be an emanation of divinity, the tie that connects the creature with the creator. Inasmuch as Wollstonecraft applauded Rousseau's scheme for a mile, she deplored the poor account of women that Rousseau presents in his treatise. In Emil, he writes about the difference between what he believes women and men need in education, since the main purpose in life for to Rousseau is for a woman to be a wife and mother, she doesn't need to be educated to the extent that men traditionally have. Instead, he maintained that the whole tendency of female education ought to be directed towards one goal, to make women pleasing. Wollstonecraft advocates for an alternative. If men and women are equally possessed of reason, they must be equally educated in its use. 
She wants both men and women to ha have the same virtues, both the domestic ones and citizenly ones. Moreover, the merits of education for women, according to Wollstonecraft, includes to prepare them for the important duties of marriage and motherhood, for example, to do with management, moral discipline, better companion, and more. She did not wish them to have power over men, but over themselves. Instead, women can become free by being enabled to earn their own subsistence, independent of men, as one man is independent of another. She asserts that no improvement of society could come about if women were not permitted to found their virtue or knowledge, and this could only happen if they were educated by the same pursuits as men. Wollstonecraft was writing at a time when, although industrialization was opening up new employment, this was, particularly for women, at very low wages and in appalling conditions. While in the middle ranks of society, women's economic dependence on men had grown with increased separation of home and work. It was in this context that Wollstonecraft insisted that women had an independent right to education, employment, property, and protection of the civil law. Women therefore needed legal rights in order to make independent rational choices and achieve virtues. So Wilson Cross says, and here I quote, If only men would generously break our chains and be content with rational fellowship instead of slavish obedience, they would find us more observant daughters, more affectionate sisters, more faithful wives, more reasonable mothers, in a word, better citizens. Her work was later dedicated to French minister Talleyrand in the hope that he would include women's rights under the new French constitution. All right, guys, I'm going to stop here for today. If you guys want to see more videos on the subject, then please do keep on watching the channel. I hope you learn a thing or two about Wollstonecraft. And if you find this video useful, please do not forget to leave a thumbs up and comment down below. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.